Open your Bibles to the book of Joshua. As I said a few moments ago, and again, welcome to our visit from Phil, Brother Phil. Good to have you with us today. God bless you. Let's stand together for the reading of the Word of God in the book of Joshua today, in the Old Testament. Let's begin in chapter 23 and then read a verse or two in chapter 24 as we study the Scriptures today and may God speak to our hearts. Let me give you an update on my health. I know everybody has health problems, but... Uh, I'll give you an explanation. Uh, I'm in a lot of pain uh, in the back, left leg, left knee, and I got an artificial knee on the left side, got an artificial knee on the right side. I don't know why they're hurting. I fell after I got my MRI, bruised myself up pretty good, and uh, went back to get the check on the MRI, and the doctor showed me my insides. Boy, it's a beautiful sight to see. <laughs> I know I'm good looking on the outside, but when I looked on the inside, wow. I said, get those ugly pictures down pretty quick. And uh, he looked at it, and he began to point out problems that he saw. And he says, I believe it's your back. And so I want to start you with injections next week on Thursday. So you pray for me. Uh, I don't usually mention a lot of things publicly. Uh, but uh, it's been a threefold battle with the back and the leg and the knees. And sometimes trembling, sometimes unstable. And uh, so I appreciate your prayers. And then above all that falling on top of that, bruising myself. Don't you feel sorry for me? I mean, you yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, I get a little sympathy from time to time. But you pray God's will can be done. Everybody goes through battles and problems, plus only have one here and a today. So I'm, if you say amen over here, well, say amen. 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 Good, Willie. I heard it all right. Try it again. Amen. I expect to hear that while I'm preaching. Okay. Good. Chapter 23, verse 1. The closing life of Joshua as a matter of fact, he's about 110 years of age and when he comes down to the climax of the book, as Moses did when he climaxed the book of Deuteronomy. Several times through Deuteronomy, he said, this is what God wants me to, for me to tell you, and gave instructions, and even right down to the Ten Commandments and so forth and how you ought to live. Now Joshua, who is the captain, uh, took the Israelites into the Promised Land after Moses was forbidden to go in because he had sinned against God. And it came to pass as lo a long time after that the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about that Joshua waxed old and stricken in age. And Joshua called for all Israel and, all, and for their elders and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers and said unto them, I am an old and stricken in age. And yet ye have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he that hath fought for you. All God's people said. Amen. Chapter 24, verse 1. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nashor, and they have served other gods. Verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. The great text of Joshua closing out his life. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's say it together. Ready? But as for me and my house... We will serve the Lord. I'm going to talk to you about a priest with a plan. A priest with a plan. And may I remind you that you are a priest. A royal priesthood. Peter says that we are. So everybody in this room is a priest. And they have certain access to the Father in behalf of others. Joshua becomes a priest in this context. We'll talk about it in just a moment. Father, help us to glean the truth from the Word of God on this Father's Day. We realize all Scripture is for all of us, regardless of our age, regardless of our position in life. 
the Word of God can speak to us even while we're speaking to a certain category. You're able to minister grace to other folks. I pray for the fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit of God upon my life. Lord, would you touch my lips as you touch the lips of Isaiah. Lord, would you help me to see you holy, 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 high and lifted up. And may, Lord, some way you just enable me by your grace to preach a few minutes. I need your help today. Pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon my life. I yield myself to you the best way I know how. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Her name was Samora Smart Dodd, who was raised by her father after her mother died. In young age, the father took over the reign of being a father and a mother, did not have a mother in the home. But she wanted to honor her father. And so on the third Sunday of June, she decided she was just going to recognize her father. She said, for his courage, for his selflessness, and being a loving man. And from that day, the third Sunday in June, it became known in the community and began to spread until 1924 when they officially made the third Sunday in June Father's Day. What a tremendous tribute she had to her father. Just simple, but something she wanted to do from her heart. Not everybody has the ideal home. May I say it repeatedly through this message. Nobody has a perfect home. Nobody. Nobody has an ideal home in every aspect even though there's always things we can improve in and we ought to be the very best we could for God. But a good father is one of the most unsung, one of the most unnoticed and unappreciated heroes in all of humanity. When you read the Old Testament, Father Abraham, you read about Moses and his children, you read about the priests and their children and so forth, or men of God in the Old Testament prophets, if you please, who had children, and the kings that had children. Sometimes they did good, sometimes they did bad, as you read through the Chronicles and the kings of the Old Testament. But they're unsung heroes. In this room today, there are some men who are fathers or grandfathers. You've made a contribution and an impact upon your family, unbeknownst to you. A young man, I say young, he was in his 60s probably. He walked in the church the other day. I was sitting here talking to the Vermos. He walked down the aisle and he said, I've been wanting to see you. So I stood up and introduced himself. It was Ken Martin Jr. His daddy was Ken Martin. And I uh, knew Ken real well. Ken come to church for a period of time over the past years. And he said, I come by to tell you I thank you for preaching the gospel when I was a little boy. And I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And I just want to come by to say thank you for preaching to me. He said, I haven't always lived the way I should, but I'm back in church living right, went through some troubles and trials, but I'm grateful that there was a time in my life. I just want to come back and say to you, thank you for that. And it was a sort of a special moment that day to know, not because of me, because the gospel of the Lord still works. Amen. And I'm grateful that folks grow up sometimes. No, he said, I want the best father. He said, I'm not the best husband in the world. As a matter of fact, I've got a lot more room for improvement. But he said, by the grace of God, I want to die serving my Lord. Sort of like Joshua of old. Joshua now is 110 years of age. And he knows it. He says, I'm old and stricken in age at 110. Moses lived to be 120 before he died. And he died and God buried him on Mount Nebo. And God would not allow Moses to go in the promised land because of that event when he struck the water, struck the rock, when he was supposed to speak to the rock. And Jesus can't be stricken twice. And so he struck it, struck it, struck it is that a word? He struck it the first time and water came forth. And then they got thirsty another time and Moses takes his rod and strikes it. And God forbid him to go into the Holy Land, but he took him to Mount Nebo. And let him look over and say, this is all that we've been looking for, Moses. Goes all the way back to Abraham's day. And now here you are on this mountain. And you're going to die. I want you to see it before you die. And he came back again on the Mount of Transfiguration. And there he was with Jesus as they talked about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Moses did not get to enter the promised land. His successor, Joshua, who was a man who followed Moses uh, every day of his life, Eventually, when Moses was to leave, Joshua was chosen to be the man to take them over the promised land. And he did that. He said, now the land is at rest. We're at peace. He says, I've come to the time of my life that I'm old and stricken. It's time for me to die, in essence. 
I realize my hours are numbered, my days are numbered. He called all of the men, the tribes of Israel, to Shechem. I mean, he had them all there for what we would call his inaugural address, his farewell address. And he began to talk to them about the subjects that God wanted him to say. And everything that Joshua says in this passage comes from the heart before God, and I think from God, and God wanted people to serve him in every generation. Uh, sometimes we look at dads and say, they're, they're all right. You ever wonder what dad's favorite words are? There's some favorite words daddies have. I've used them. Now listen very carefully. See if you've used them. Well, go ask your mother. <coughs> Isn't that a good phrase? Go ask your mother. Number two, just wait till I get home. You ever heard a dad say that? And then this one, I, my daddy said, when I was young and your age, I had to walk to school in the snow. Or sometimes they'd say, I'm busy right now. And you felt like maybe you was ignored at times. But these same fathers who sometimes had little cachets that they had carried an awesome responsibility on their home. Did you know that a man is to be the provider and he is to be the protector and he is to be the priest of his home? Amen. And I'm going to tell you what, that's an awesome responsibility. When Andrew, we adopted him when he was nine months of age and we're sitting in the recliner and I looked at the little face of nine months of old and I quoted him the Romans road, a plan of salvation. And I said, Andrew, do you understand that? And he went, sort of spit on me. You couldn't quite understand what I meant at nine months of age. But I wanted him to know that God's word would be important in my home. I'll come back to that in just a moment because I believe we're failing a generation. I say we. This is a we sermon. It's not a you sermon. Somebody put the prayer like this about fathers. Menders of toys, leaders of boys. Change of fuses, kisses or bruise, uh, bruises. Blessing, O oh Lord. Mover of couches, soother of ouches, ponder of pounder of nails, teller of tales. Reward him, O oh Lord. Hanger of screens, counselor of teens, fixer of bikes, chastiser of tykes. Help him, Lord, help him. Raker of leaves, cleaner of eaves, dryer of dishes, fulfiller of wishes. Bless him, O oh Lord. My Joshua now is summing the people together. He's got a message, this farewell address. He's the priest of the home. Go back to the book of Deuteronomy, if you would, please. As we look at what we want to get across this morning before we dismiss. The priest is to instruct his family. Joshua has instructing his family and also all of those that met at Shechem, all the tribes of Israel. He said, as for me and my house, we want to serve the Lord. And because of the fact that it was settled in Joshua's mind, he said, as for me and, me, and, me and my house, we want to serve the Lord. Period. Period. David said, my heart is fixed. Period. Here it's settled in Joshua's mind. After all these years, was he ever tempted to quit? I'm sure he was. Was there times when he fell on his face? I'm sure there was. Were there times when he was bold and courageous as he went into battle? Sure there was. Here he is with all the scars and the mars of his life and all the different chapters of his life. He's old now. He's come to the sunset of his life. He says, I have one desire. That's for me and my house. I want to serve the Lord. I think every daddy here who's saved wants to see his family know the Lord. Ain't going to matter about 100 years from now. Ain't going to matter much 50 years from now what most of us think is important. We're going to die. And the blood is going to congeal in our veins and we're going to drop a lifeless lump of clay. Somebody said it well. The only thing I have to leave behind is a legacy to my children. Whether it's good, bad, or ugly, Sometimes even the fathers, sometimes could be the best fathers, even though we may look at them and say, they're not very good. But to a child, that's my daddy. Sometimes they want to grab the leg and hold on to their dad. Sometimes they want to follow in his footsteps, and rightly so. Sometimes that's bad, sometimes it's good. But the fact is, a daddy is important, very important in the home. He is the priest. The responsibility for the spiritual life of his family. Let's read it together. Back in Moses when he was recording what they needed to know before he died. Chapter 6. Let's start with verse 4. and We'll come back to verse 1 in just a moment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. We're talking about the Shema. 
that which was the word of God to be handed down to the succeeding generations that was read to the children, the grandchildren. And he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. He records that again in the book of Matthew. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy might. You see how the Bible comes together and connects together. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house, and on thy gates. Verse 12, Then beware lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee out forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name. Chapter 11, verse 18. This is where I want to camp for just a few moments. Chapter 11, verse 18. Therefore shall ye lay up these words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And ye shall teach them diligently shall teach your children, speaking of them which thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt write them upon the doorpost of thine house, and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied, and the days of your children in the land which your father swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments which I command you to do, them to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him. This past week in revival, Brother Vermas put on the screen, what's the greatest commandment in all the world? It's not one of the ten, even though it's implied. But Jesus said the greatest commandment in all the world is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy mind. What is the second commandment? And I can undo it, and that's to love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two hangs all the law, hinges all the things that God has taught from Genesis to the book of Revelation. It all hangs on those two verses. You should love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul. And so when you come down to realize that Joshua was a provider for his family, which goes without saying, if you're a dad, that falls upon you. A man who does not provide for his own household is worse than an infidel. That's what the Bible said. And so every man has a responsibility. Sometimes he has to work hard. Sometimes he has to work extra. Sometimes he has to uh, work long hours. He can't always do everything he wants to do, but he wants to provide for his family. When you realize you hold a piece of eternity in your hand for the first time, as I was talking about a while ago, looking at Andrew's eyes, uh, it, it just sort of struck me. A piece of eternity. There'll never be a day he'll not exist. He is eternal. You either have eternal life or eternal death. I have either eternal life or eternal death. I will be somewhere a thousand years from now. I'll either be in the clouds in the, in the glory land world, walking on streets of gold, or I'll be burning and sizzling in the pit of hell uh, for the, the place that God has prepared for the devil and his angels. You'll go there as an intruder. God wants nobody to go to hell. But if you don't serve the Lord, you're not saved and serve the Lord. Now you're saved. You don't go to heaven because you serve the Lord, but you're saved by the grace of God. God, and then you want to serve the Lord. And every individual should begin a trip. Once they're saved, is to live for Jesus the rest of their life and let their life count for God. I was born to serve the Lord. I reminisce a little bit this week about my dad. He died at age 57, started preaching when he was 13. He was one of 15 kids back in the hills of West Virginia. I think it was a creek called Big Ugly or something like that. And they were all farm boys raised out in, out in the country and Grandpa Paulie, whom I'm after, I named after, his name is James, beautiful name, and they call me James. He was a singer, and I am too. My wife looked over a while ago, I think I was off tune a little bit singing. She just wanted to tenderly remind me, shut up, James, you're off tune. You ever get married for a while, you can read people's eyes. If you've been married any length of time, you can, you can find vibration just by looking at each other. 
you know it's time to leave? The man goes, the woman says, well, I believe it's time for us to go. He talked with his eyes. Or he's just giving inflection of voice. And sometimes we can read each other's minds. You live long enough, you almost, they say, you look like each other. The longer you live, the more you look like each other. My wife is a beautiful woman. And the older you get, the more you look like them. Somebody says, at least you think a lot alike, even though you're different. There's a lot of things of similarities that draw you together. But here's Joshua. He's instructing his family about the things of God. The same thing that he's going to give out then is what God gave to Moses in chapter 6. Here again in chapter 11, verse 18. But let's look at it for just a second. Therefore, based on all I've said, Joshua, Moses said, I want you to get these words. I want you to load the boat. I want you to get the boat loaded. Here's what he says. Therefore shall you lay up these words in your heart, in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house and upon thy gates. You say, preacher, we heard that already. Remember, repetition is the key to learning. God only has to say something one time, but he repeats it. You better get your ears tuned up to be attentive to what you've got to say. When God gives you instructions in the word of God, it's not just take up space and say, well, I can do that. Maybe, maybe I will. Maybe I won't. If you're a priest that's been sanctified for God, a father that's been saved by the grace of God, or a man who's been saved by the grace of God, he reigns in that situation of being in the royal priesthood and has a divine responsibility to God. So here he is, he's trying to charge them with his address as well as warn them, especially Joshua and so with Moses. And he said, I want you to lay up. So I thought about that for a while and I got to thinking and reading some scriptures and I want to give you four thoughts just very briefly. When you read Deuteronomy chapter 11, I said, uh, yeah, chapter 11, verse 18 through 25. Deuteronomy opens the, by these words, the first chapter. These be the words which Moses spake to Israel on this side of Jordan in the wilderness. I mean, it opens with God speaking to Moses to speak to the people. Here's what he says in chapter 4, verse 9. Only take heed to thyself and give thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. Chapter 5, verse 32. Ye shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God hath commanded you. Ye shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Ye shall walk in all thy ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that ye may live and that it may be well with you. And ye shall prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. Chapter 6, the book of Deuteronomy. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord. Verse 18. That it may be well with thee. And that thou shalt go in and possess the good land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers. Chapter 11, I just read. Therefore, shall ye lay up these words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be frontlets between your eyes. Number one, lay up. Notice the phraseology. Lay up these words. He didn't say lay up the word I'm giving you. I want you to lay up the words. I have in my hand today, after the years have passed, every word of the Lord. When he wrote to Moses, he had words he was already given. And when he completes the canon of scriptures, every, you've got to have an every word Bible. You can't have one that leaves some out, puts some in, adds to and takes away. That's danger of judgment of God, tamper with the word of God. I was reading a version last night and studying how they left out an entire verse in the book of Acts. Just left it out. A very popular version that we could probably allude to quickly. Just left the entire verse out. Who gives anybody the right to take away from the Word of God and to add to the Word of God? None, because this is the only book God wrote. God wrote it. You say, how do you write it? He breathed upon holy men of God, and as they were inspired, they penned it. I believe exactly like God wanted it to be penned. I believe in a dictation theory. I believe if they call it a theory, maybe a dictation in fact, that every word of God is exactly as God wanted it to be down. 
He may use different kind of writers, different men with different personalities. He knows their personality. You say, this is the writings of Paul. or that's the writing of Moses. God knew that before he gave it to him. And he used their personality to pen the word of God. But every word was superintended by the Holy Spirit of God. And God wrote exactly like he wanted. So when he said, I want you to lay up right beside that, the word deposit. The word deposit. Then I want us to go to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. And lay up words, the words that I give you. This is the primary book. This is the most important book in your life, what we have before us today. It is not something to lay on the shelf. It's not something to gather dust. It's not something you pick up once a week. Listen to me, men. And I speak mainly to us men, whether you're a father or not. How often do you pick up the book at home? One thing that needs to be done is learn that we have had deposited to us and committed to us a great truth. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, and let's read what Paul said in the writings to Timothy. Verse 12, For the which cause I also suffer these things. I've been going through persecution, he was saying. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know in whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed. There it is unto him against that day. The word committed means deposit in account. You deposit in God's bank account. I have committed this to God. I'm suffering, yes. I'm facing death, yes. I don't know what tomorrow holds, Timothy, but I write unto you to say I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed of the power of God. It's the power of God and the salvation. And I'm glad that down deep in the recesses of my soul that I've trusted in the grace of God and know that I'm saved on my way to heaven. It's important for you to load the boat and make deposits regularly. Amen. And so it was, he says, lay up these words. Where are you going to lay them at? In your heart. What does he distinguish between a heart and a soul? So is the personality we have and how we function. The heart where it begins. A man shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Everything down deep on the inside becomes the very place where it's deposited so it can affect the rest of the personality. Amen. See, it comes down to my heart and then it affects my whole being. Listen to me. You know the reason why I can't play poker? The reason I don't gamble? Because these ain't my hands. Amen. You know the reason why I don't go dancing? It's because these are not my feet. You know the reason why I don't want to look at pornography? Because he's not my eyes. You know the reason why I want to please God? Because the Bible says my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost of God. And you've been bought with a price and you're not your own. And that price was the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am not my own. I'm a vessel and you're a vessel. And Joshua said, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. I submit to you today, he made a deposit that was good. He said, I'm 110. I'm old. Now, we won't be old until we get to be 110. Reckon? I'm old. I, I was telling Fred or somebody a while ago, it was amazing in the Old Testament when God saw Samuel. He said, Samuel, thou art old. Don't you think Samuel knew that? Thou art old. And here's Moses saying, I'm now old and stricken in age. He was 120. He still was able to go and still able to function good. Had his, has his faculties about him. But God says, it's time to go. It's time. You can have perfect health and die tomorrow. Moses had health that was good. His eyes were not dim. He was still ready to do what he needed to do for God. And God said, that's it. Well, let me live a little while longer, Lord. Maybe I could do some more things for you. He said, your time's up. I have one lifetime to live for God. It's going to end one of these days. And most of us in this room, we get a little older. Oh, God, help us to pray for a younger generation yeah. to get a hold of the truth. God, help our young people. I watched them other night in the crusade. I sat back over here and I watched some of these little boys and girls, how enthusiastic they got about certain things, how they even sat and listened to the Bible stories as was preached yeah. attentively. I thought, oh, God, save a generation. Yeah. I preached two weeks ago what we're going to do with the children. These little children need some help. They need some fathers. And sometimes we have to step in and be a father at times to kids because they don't have anybody. I got an email this week. Thank you for being a father to me over the years. I appreciate that. I wish I were better at doing that. Sometimes well, I heard, remember years, years ago when Dr. Howes was preaching, he said he went out the alley. He usually makes his way out the back door uh, to get to his vehicle to leave church because he can't talk to everybody in the big church years ago. He said a little bus kid was out there. A little bus kid said, Mr. Howes, can I ask you a question? He said, son, you sure can. He came up and sort of got a hold of his leg. The boy got a hold of Dr. Lyhouse's leg. 
He looked up at him and said, are you God? Are you God? Dr. Howell says, I walked away. Not braggadociously. Look at me. He thinks I'm God. But oh God, he thinks I'm like you. Well, impressionable minds. By the time they're seven, some of the greatest impressions of their life are going to be made for time and eternity. I know God can save anybody, anytime, any age. But you all know, we all know, most people are saved below the age of 25. Just statistics. If I took them again today, they'd be about the same. And many of us got saved when we were children. Some of us had to get some reinforcements along the way. We made those decisions when we were kids. You know, most kids haven't done I never, I never committed adultery at age of nine. I never killed anybody. Thought, killed about, thought about it a few times. My sister, but I let her live. I, I didn't never steal anything. I stole a penny one time. And I didn't pay full price for a candy bar one time. So, but who said the other night, if you steal one penny, that makes you what? A thief. I had to realize I was a sinner, even though I was good in my own eyes. I wasn't a bad little boy. I hadn't been out doing that. I hadn't drugs. I have never tasted alcohol in my life. I have no idea what it tastes like unless it's NyQuil. I have no idea what alcohol tastes like. I've never had a shot of, in my arms for dope. I have no idea. But I want to know they're precious. God loves everybody. There's not anybody he doesn't love. And I'm grateful for that. I won't go to heaven because I was good. I go to heaven because I was saved with the grace of God. You won't go to heaven because you're doing good and doing right. You go to heaven because you're trusting in the finished work of Calvary. And when he said it's finished, he meant what, you know what he meant? The sacrifice has been paid. The debt has been paid. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And I'm glad that God's done that. The priest is to instruct his family about God. And so he needs to make a deposit regularly in his own heart. See, he's got to put it in here before it's going to come out here. Boy, we fail so often. I say we. We fail to load the boat on the inside so that when the opportunity comes to teach our children on the outside, when they get up in the morning, when they go by the way, when they rest, when they come home, when they go to bed at night, he puts in a lot of categories where were to be teaching opportunities. Can I ask you a question? What is the first word that comes out of your mouth when you get up in the morning, once you get awake? What is the first thing your children hear? Is it fussing and fighting already? Do our children live amongst fussing and fighting and bickering all the time? See, a house is supposed to be a place that's precious in the eyes of God. It's supposed to be a refuge for all of us. And how many times we have storms in our life? We do. And sometimes it's our own fault. We create storms. We cause problems because we don't do it the way God wants us to. But he says, you make that deposit. And along the way, when your children are able to be taught, and they, they be taught very early in life, when thou sittest in thy house. How many of you ever sit in your house? What do you do when you sit in your house? Well, I sit there and we, we watch television. We sit there sometimes and we just look at each other. Or sometimes we just sit down at the table and we eat. Sometimes we sit at the table and we eat. And sometimes we sit at the table and we just, we just eat. And then we sit down and watch television for a while and then we go to bed at night. Any teaching about God during that period of time? You know, sometimes television can be a good teacher and not much worth watching. But sometimes something does slip on television. And that's when you mute it and say, no, let's just talk about it. Don't you ever say that word in this house. You understand me? Now, I, you know, somewhere that's along the way, there has to be some controls on television. I understand that. And we're getting more and more desperate in that area. Even the radio is bad enough. I mean, any place you go, if you want to hear a lot of cussing, go to Walmart. I was in line this week, and man, he was giving a woman a fit. The guy was checking out. He was giving her a once and for all, and she was just trying to do her job, being apologetic to him. But he wasn't going to hear that, and he, he just cussed her out after in front of everybody. It's terrible everywhere. And little kids hear that. I like it when you take your kids to the store and uh, they holler out something about, used to be about cigarettes. They come by and say, Daddy, that guy's smoking. And he'll look at him and say, that's bad for you. I mean, the kid's telling the adult, no, son, that's not your job to straighten him out. But it is bad for you. And you've taught him it was bad. You've taught him the liquor was bad. See somebody drinking. They are the first responsible to be, I ought not do that. And they can't straighten everybody else's life out. But there needs to be that deposit made in our life. If I'm going to be a priest unto God and to be able to give instruction, I've got to know something. 
Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I don't want to know about him. I want to know him. I can't know him without a relationship day by day. I can't, I can't know him until I lay up the words of eternal God and let them be applied in my life so when the time comes, it can come out and hopefully I can be a help or a blessing to somebody. We all need that. Teaching lessons come at all hours of the day. Lead your children to God very early. At least let them know about God. Walk out of the moonlight and there's the moon. Who made the moon, son? God did. Don't ever forget it. When the rain comes, who sent the rain? God did. Amen. Everything of nature that happens is teaching opportunity. You see that beautiful tree over there? Only God can make that like that. Don't ever forget it. Don't ever forget it. We're constantly loading the boat from the deposit that we are ahead in our life that we can lay up the words of God in our heart and then in our outer being can testify to the marvelous grace of God in our life. The priest, the little boy, was scared of the dark. And the storm was coming. And the daddy said, God loves you and he'll take care of you, son. He says, I know God loves me. But right now, I want somebody who has some skin on them. Wow. Only a cow can give that kind of theology. I love God, but I don't see God. And the only person I see, daddy, is you. So could I have a God with some skin on him? It goes back again to a father when he looks down at that child realizing that he's the skin who's supposed to have the deposit of God on the inside. What a tremendous, awesome responsibility. While thou sittest, talk to him about Christ. While thou walkest by the way, show him the things that God's done. When thou liest down at night, how many of you had little prayers you prayed when you went to bed at night? How many ever prayed, now I lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to you? Raise your hand. How would you learn that? Where would you get that from? Who ever told you that? I'll tell you where it came from. It came from some godly mom or daddy who said, now let's bow our heads and pray and thank the Lord for the good day and pray the prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die for a week, pray the Lord my soul to take. Bless daddy, bless mommy. Man, we all had a prayer memorized. The little boy, he prayed every night down by the bed and he got tired of it one time. He wrote it out, tacked it to the end of the bed and said, read it for yourself, God, I'm tired. But every little child learned how to pray if they did. And uh, God is great, God is good, let me thank you for the food. And sometimes old timers prayed long prayers. I mean, I've been around preachers all my life and we had them in our homes and sometimes missionaries and, and they call on them to pray. We're about to starve and some preacher prays around the world, prays for everybody, I'm saying it's wrong. I'm just saying, Lord, help me to get through the prayer quickly. We enjoy the prayer, but we enjoy the food better, maybe. Kids think on a different level sometimes. But everything that we do is teaching and illustrations for imparting. You don't know what goes in their mind. And I, I'll say this, and, and you won't know who it is. I could tell you who it is. I could call his name right now. He's not here this morning. He was raised knowing the truth. He was raised in a Christian home. I remember at the age of 40, I was talking to him, and we said, I, said, I, asked, I was asking some questions. I said, how are things spiritually? He says, we're not good, preacher. I said, do you ever think about the things of God? He said, you may think I'm lying. There's not a day that passes that I don't think about what mom and dad and what you taught us at church. He says, I have lived it, and he says, I'm miserable. I can't turn loose. I can't let God take care of my life. Just pray for me. And we had prayed for him. Saw him the other night. We had prayer in his backyard. I'm telling you, people will grow old knowing the truth. But they may go to hell just knowing the truth. Because it's not enough just to know about the truth. You've got to know the truth. I am the way, the truth. I am the way of life. I'm the way to go to heaven. And there's no other way. And every individual has got to come that way. Well, I won't get through these four points. But the second one is be on display. When you read chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, it's like your life is on display. I want to show you this. And we realize the Bible says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. And the only way you shine is because He shines on you. He says, I am the light of the world. Then He says, Ye are the lights of the world. Now I'll tell you to take a great responsibility on a father as a priest with a plan. I'm going to give instruction to my child regularly. 
as early as possible, they ought to start hearing about the things of God. And thank God for those who have. You say, well, I hadn't done too good a job at it. Maybe we can start now. I'm the, I, I like the fact that God's a God of a second chance. Amen. I'm glad God's a God of a third chance. How many of you, you, don't have to raise your hand, how many of you blew it along the way? How many of you said, boy, I, I wish I'd have got saved earlier, or I wish I hadn't done this when I got saved and backslid away from God and had an impact on my family, and boy, I'm so sorry for that. Don't you know God loves you? God's not here with a whip trying to beat you to death. He wants you to obey Him, and you'll suffer if you don't because that's just the way the law is. But He loves you. He loves me when I'm good. He loves me when I'm bad. He loves me when I do well with my family. He loves me when I make mistakes and sometimes regret it. I'm just glad God loves me, and I'm glad that He is able to give us the Word of God to make a deposit in our life and that we can find it to be on display day by day. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8 through 9, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. It needs to be discussed. I'm talking about the lay up the Word of God, lay up the words of God, discuss the Word of God. Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7, again that scripture says, And these words which command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently. Under thy children. How many of y'all believe the Bible is true? Amen. Are we supposed to do this or not? Am I just up here getting the sermon over and by 10 after I'll be through? We'll go home and eat and come back tonight. Is that all I'm supposed to do? I just need to resign my position and step down. The Word of God is like falling on deaf ears sometimes. It sort of goes in one ear and out the other. Well, we've got our sermon over with, or well, hurry up and get through preaching because i got things to do. I'm not a long-winded preacher. So the other day by nature, I'm, I'm not. When I do 40, 45 minutes, I'm through, usually with most sermons. But the fact is, I need what I'm telling you, you need. Amen. Amen. You know, when I was coming up, you know what was always around in, in our house? There were Bible verses everywhere. There was a Bible laying on the end table where Dad did two things. He read the Bible and did crossword puzzles. You know what I have in our house? I have a Bible that's in, and I work crossword puzzle. I moved into high tech and moved to computer. I can do it on computer now with uh, crossword puzzles. I love to do it. I love to play Scrabble and games like that. But oh, how many times my dad would read from the book? It was always there. It was always in view. Pictures were in view about things that about remind you about God. You may have pictures of the family. Mom would always put those graduating pictures up. And we all looked pretty on the wall. Some of us looked better than others. It was on the wall. And yet, around there somewhere is going to be scriptures, scriptures, crocheted or knitted, places where you could see the Word of God. When you rise up in the morning, wouldn't it be good to see? I have a little plaque in my office called Pray for Power, and uh, I used to have it on the dash of my car. I got it on my computer now. I see it regularly. Pray for power, pray for power, pray for power. You say, what's that do? The scriptures can remind you that you are to discuss the Word of God with your family. And teach them the eternal truths of God. If you don't do it, who's going to do it? If you're saved and I'm saved, it's my responsibility to rear my children right. Sometimes you do it wrong. Not a parent in here. I've, I've read every, I've got 45 books on child rearing. Many of them did better than others. But you can take a family of five kids, raise them the same way. Three turn out good and two don't. Why is that? Because they still have a free will. There's no guarantees. Some may think they are, but if you want to read the Holy Scriptures, you'll find some of the greatest people in the world failed, including Adam and Eve, who were perfect. Including Solomon, who wrote the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. He said, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. I've learned this. I'm an old man now. I've learned this. These don't satisfy these things. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man summed up in just one verse. Don't take a lot of verses for God to sum things up. Remind your kids God loves you. Have a good day at school. Don't forget to pray. Boy, we, we need to be reminding. Put things out there they can see that remind them of God. They don't have to be reminded of all the other things we see. I've been visiting. I've been in revivals for years, and, and I, I haven't gone in a long time because of various reasons. But, you know, I used to preach about five or six revivals every year. And I try not to miss but one Sunday or maybe a Sunday night and try to start the revival on a Sunday night and get back in time for so I wouldn't miss much church. I just believe in being in the house of God. I believe you do feel the same way. But the fact is, I've been in a lot of preachers' homes. I've been in a lot of deacons' homes. 
Sometimes we're sitting around, we go by the bedroom of the boy, and on the wall are idols. Some of the basketball stars, the baseball stars. Some of them may be good Christian, but most of them are not. Some of them live in a lifestyle. It's like the basketball player who said, I'm not a role model. Said that publicly when folks said, you need to clean up your mouth and live differently because you're a role model. He says, I'm not a role model to anybody. Charles Barkley said those words. I don't know what he says today, but I'm submitting to you that every man who walks on God's earth, who breathes God's breath, who knows God personally, has a divine mandate from God Almighty. And I have a divine mandate in my soul to do the very best I can to put everything around because when the dust is settled and the boat goes out to sea and the life is ended and the life may be a sinking ship and go down without a life preserver, we need to load the boat and give them all we can day after day, day after day, day after day. You say, they may get tired of hearing it. They may get tired of taking a bath too. You say, well, they get tired of certain things after a while. You make them do things that you think are important, don't you? How many, I don't know, I know. I'm not going to ask. How many brush your teeth? Some of us can take them out now and just hold them up, you know. You brush your teeth. Why do you brush your teeth? Some people brush their teeth more than once a day. Some do it twice a day. Some do it after every meal. And you, I've talked about some people brush their tongue. I mean, they got a mouth full of Colgate cream all the time. Just brushing, brushy, 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 brushy. Well, who taught you to brush your teeth? Well, Mama told me I was supposed to do that. Or Daddy said, brush your teeth. Somebody said, brush your teeth. Amen. How many told you to do a certain thing? Somebody did. Amen. Well, bless be God. Let's do what God says and tell them about the great God of heaven who is the creator and the controller and the savior of our soul and is in charge of our life and the great judge will all appear before every child, every young man, every young lady, every adult, every old man who's tricking in age needs to know thus saith the word of the living God. Get it settled. Get it deposited. Let it be on display. Let it be discussed day after day that others around us can see Christ in us, the hope of glory. Amen. It ought to be desired. I want to read two verses and I'm through. Turn to the book of Psalms 19. Psalms 19 and verse 10. Talking about the Word of God. When you read the Word of God, you see it over and over again, especially in chapter 119. But here in verse 9 of verse chapter 19, the fear of the Lord is clean. Our young people need cleanness. What shall wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What's going to make a difference in my life to live a clean life? The lay up of the words in my heart. I'll tell you, let me just, before I read the verse, when you sin, what do you do? If you're saved today and the Holy Ghost dwells in you, when you sin, you very quickly want to confess it. Amen. Christians are great confessors, great repenters. You say, well, I don't do much wrong. I want to say, duh. Most of us do more wrong than we like to admit. See, we get sort of satisfied with how we live and to know to do good and do it and not to him and his sin. Little eyes are watching us all the time. By example, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Thank God we have a forever Bible. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Verse 10, more to be desired are they than go. Yea, then much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Chapter 119, verse 103. How sweet are thy words. Not just word. Words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than the honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. I close with an illustration about a dying boy. I thought about it. Fred and Larry probably know who it was, the young man who died of leukemia, who rode one of our buses. We visited him in Winston-Salem Hospital, I think it was, when he was dying. And he just gave a good testimony. I forget his first name even. Rode one of our buses. What was it? David. Yeah. David Gow. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, David Yow. And David was losing weight and he was dying. And he said, we asked him about his spiritual life. He says, I, I'm saved. I'm ready to go to heaven. 
if we never run another bus. That one bus rider is worth more than the whole world. Amen. If you gain the whole world and lose your own soul, what is it worth? David went to heaven, but I'm glad he rode one of our buses. I'm glad he made a decision for Christ. I'm glad for folks who come by car, come by truck, come by bus, come anyway to church. But the important thing is they get to know the Lord Jesus Christ. The dedicated pastor had a young son. He became very ill. And after an exhausting series of tests, the father was given the news that his son had terminal illness. The youngster had accepted Christ as his Savior. The pastor knew death would usher him into glory, but wondered how to inform him while he was still in the bloom of his youth. How am I going to tell him that he's going to die? Gently, he picked up the Bible and read passages, and he prayed. And he said to him with a soft voice, the doctors could only promise you a few more days, son. Are you afraid to meet Jesus? My boy, are you afraid? And blinking away a few tears, no, daddy, not if God is like you. I'm all right. Looking in the face of a daddy on a dying bed can make a difference in all of our lives, whether it be a child looking at a parent or a parent looking at a child. The day is going to come with that little frail hand is going to drop. The chin will drop. Eyes will close. Stiff as a board. They've gone. May God help us today to be the priest in our home, give instructions. And I'll finish the other part of the message sometime in the future. Father.